Viking sails were spotted off the coast of England during the late 920s. Yet these warriors hadn't crossed the sea to raid, nor had they come to make war upon the newly forged nation. Instead, they had come on a diplomatic mission. Their destination, the court of King Athelstan, grandson of Alfred the Great, and the first king to bear the title King of the English. Though the ships were likely manned by battle-hardened Nordic warriors, hailing from the frosted fjordlands of the north, their dragon boats carried another cargo too, a young boy of around 10 years old, a prince, and if the sagas are to be believed, the youngest son of the veteran Norwegian king, Harald Fairhair. The boy's name was Hakon, and for close to a decade he would remain at Athelstan's court, raised as a foster son to the English king, alongside a number of other royal princes from all over Europe, until finally, years later, he returned to Norway along with an English fleet to reclaim his birthright. At the time of Hakon's birth, probably in around 918, his father Harald Fairhair had already ruled over Norway for many decades, during that time gradually consolidating the various Jarldoms into something of a centralised state. If the sagas are to be believed, Fairhair was well into his 70s by the time of Hakon's birth and he had already divided up Norway between his numerous sons from different marriages, with his intention being to pass the overall high kingship of Norway onto one of them. By the time Hakon began to grow up, however, his elder half-brother Eric had began a violent campaign of murder against the other brothers, succeeding in killing several of them and earning himself the title Blood Axe for his ferocity and his prowess in battle. Now an old man, and sensing the winds of change beginning to blow through the nation he had spent so much time and effort in forging, Harold Fairhair decided to send his son to England to be fostered with Athelstan, a king who he seems to have had good relations with, possibly as both rulers were known to have contended with men from Denmark. According to one of the Norse sagas, Athelstan was essentially tricked into accepting the boy, so that it would appear to Harold's subjects that he was of a higher rank than the English king. However, it is also known that the English court at this time was a hub of cultural learning, where many European princes were fostered and taught the arts of kingship, warfare and political strategy. This, coupled with the fact that relations between Norway and England seem to have been pretty good at the time, as evidenced by extensive archaeological finds, and the existence of a mutual enemy in the form of the Danes, made Athelstan's court an obvious choice for the young boy to be sent to. Hakon would never again see his father after he boarded that boat. Shortly after Fairhair's death, Eric Bloodaxe succeeded to the High Kingship of Norway and continued his ruthless policy of murdering any and all political opposition, including elements of the nobility previously won over to Harald's camp by his political manoeuvrings and diplomacy, rather than the sheer terror supposedly employed by Bloodaxe. Meanwhile, in England, Hakon is said to have become a favourite of Athelstan, a king already well known for his amicable diplomatic relations between Norse and Dane elements within England, from which many of his soldiers hailed, and he also traditionally fostered a good relationship with the Norwegian crown. Athelstan was a European-style monarch. He likely saw himself as the heir to Charlemagne's legacy, and as such he took pleasure in making far-flung political alliances throughout Europe. Crucially, for Hakon's life, and for the future history of Norway, the young boy became a Christian during his time in England. Meanwhile, back across the North Sea, after just a few short years of despotic and violent rule, Bloodaxe succeeded in alienating the Norwegian Jarls to such an extent that they either sent for Hakon, now around 18 years old, to return to oust his brother, or Hakon took it upon himself to return and subsequently won the support of the Jarls through his own personal charisma. Athelstan even provided the young prince with a small fleet and enough warriors to safely get him home to stake his claim. Upon his arrival, he earned the support of the Jarls by promising to restore their old rights and to rein in the centralised government that Bloodaxe had put in place. Eric Bloodaxe soon found himself deserted on all sides. He subsequently made his escape along with a small group of followers to take to the high seas, embarking on a legendary piratical career which would eventually see him become a king again. Not in Norway this time, but in the wake of Athelstan's death, he became king of a newly independent Northumbria. Athelstan had likely also had another motive in equipping Hakon with a military force and enough ships to reclaim his kingdom. They both had a common enemy in the form of the Danish Vikings of Jutland and the Isles. 
It was there, over the preceding decades, that a powerful dynasty had also been carefully consolidating power into a centralised authority, and now the latest King of Denmark, Harald Bluetooth, sought to extend his authority even further in acquiring more and more Norwegian lands to the north of his realm. The core area of Hakon's territory originally consisted of just his father's old kingdom in western Norway. Over the coming decades, however, expertly utilising the political skills that he had learned in England, Hakon succeeded in re-establishing the alliances that Harald Fairhair had made with the powerful earls of Moor and Laid, subsequently being accepted by them as their High King. And he even went further, arguably doing just as much as his father had in unifying Norway into a singular entity. In order to achieve these goals, however, he did have to sideline his own Christian beliefs. Although he did build churches and he endeavoured to spread his faith wherever he could, Norway was still staunchly pagan at the time, and Hakon's beliefs were regularly overshadowed by blood oaths to Odin and Thor, undertaken in order to win the loyalties of regional chieftains. Hakon did this expertly and won a great deal of support from the Norwegian people through his lenient and peaceful policies. Rather than having to contend with his own people, as his father and his brother Eric had done before him, Hakon's main threat was to come instead from the south, from the Danish king Harald Bluetooth and his newfound allies, the vengeful sons of Eric Bloodaxe. In around 954, after having reigned peacefully for a number of years, the first major threat to King Hakon's rule and to Norwegian independence came sailing up the Strait of Karmaset in a fleet of Danish longships. It was the vengeful sons of Eric Bloodaxe, looking to carve out lands for themselves in the wake of their father's death over the sea in the north of Britain, and now supported in their aims by the ambitious Harald Bluetooth, along with an army of bloodthirsty Danes. After summoning his forces together, Hakon sailed out to meet the invasion, engaging them at a location later named Blood Heights due to the sheer brutality of the fighting. Despite allegedly being outnumbered by the Danish army, Hakon stood his ground and won a stunning victory killing three of the Sons of Bloodaxe in the process. The Danes limped back to their dragon ships, pursued all the way by Hakon and his men, and sailed back to Denmark to lick their wounds. Yet Hakon knew that as long as they still drew breath, his surviving nephews would return. In the aftermath of Blood Heights, the situation in Norway was severe enough for Hakon to implement a form of mandatory military service known as the Lydang, which was similar to the Anglo-Saxon system of the Fjord, in order to forestall any future invasions from Denmark. It was probably a concept that Hakon had witnessed in his youth and now sought to implement in his homeland. Ancient Norse sources claim that this Norwegian defence fleet could mobilise as many as 300 ships when danger threatened, although it remains unclear if the full quota of ships was ever mobilised. A warning system consisting of hilltop cairns was also created for Norway's defence. When enemies approached from the south, these cairns were lit one after the other to warn the people so they could then prepare themselves for attack. These especially ingenious precautions against invasion stand as a testament to the statesmanship of King Hakon and the loyalty he commanded from his subjects. Harald Bluetooth and the sons of Eric Bloodaxe would return again and again over the coming years, most notably at Frey near Christiansund and at Fityar in Sunhordland always being driven away by Hakon's forces at great cost to the Norwegian defenders. During that last final invasion, Hakon received an arrow to his shoulder. The wound would eventually fester, killing him shortly afterwards. After having reigned for well over two decades, and generally being thought of as an extremely capable statesman who breathed new life into the unification begun by his father, unlike his brutal older brother Eric Bloodaxe, Hakon would go on to be remembered under a very different epithet. Hakon the Good. In the aftermath of his death, and in the absence of a strong and respected leader, Norway, for the most part, once more fragmented back into regional Jarldoms. Harald Greycloak, the eldest surviving son of Eric Bloodaxe, became the new King of Norway, though he himself was subject to the Danish King Harald Bluetooth, and ruled over little more than his father's heartlands in Western Norway. Greycloak ruled for just a few short years amidst the chaos of civil war, until, in around 970, he was eventually tricked by Bluetooth into travelling to Denmark, and subsequently killed by Bluetooth's new ally, Hakon Sigurdsson, a Jarl who then became the new de facto ruler of parts of Norway, again under Bluetooth for a time. Norway would continue to be intermittently controlled by Danish rulers, 
and regional strongmen for decades to come. Until rebellion once more put a series of strong rulers on the throne after the death of Canute the Great, the last king to directly control England, Norway and Denmark.